Welcome to the Link Caribbean Info Session. It's a pleasure for us to engage with you here today as we ramp up our implementation of Link. My name is Damien Sorendo. I'm the project coordinator. I'll introduce you to the rest of the team in a little bit. Um, I'd first, however, like to start by taking a quick look at today's proposed agenda. We'll start off with a very succinct look at what is Link Caribbean and some of its broader objectives. This will be followed by a general overview of raising angel capital, which will touch on typical characteristics of angel investors and what angel investment generally looks like. Um, this will provide the context for the next agenda item where we'll take a deeper look at the services being offered through Link and the process by which growth-oriented startups can apply. Um, we'll end the presentations with um, one that speaks to investment readiness of startups and being able to assess whether or not you are a good fit for angel investment and by extension link. We intend to leave about 20 minutes at the end for any questions that you may have and prefer to do so all during this period rather than during the presentations. So if you do have any questions, you could type them into the question window. Um, also, you could um, raise your hand, and at the end of the presentation, we will um, try and get to all the questions. If there are any similar questions, we'll try and group them and answer them in one shot. Um, so without further ado, and before getting into the presentations, I'd like to introduce you to the rest of the team. Um, again, my name is Damien Sorendo. I'm the project coordinator. I'm being assisted by Gerard Thomas, who is the project officer, and he's also acting as the country advisor for Trinidad. We also have on the line Harold Davis, who is the country advisor for Jamaica, and we are being provided with advisory support from the World Bank by Jeremy Bowman, who is the angel investing specialist for the World Bank, and Mike Lightman, who is the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Specialist for the World Bank. Just in terms of the flow for today's session, I will be handling all the link subject material, while Jeremy will speak to angel investing, and Mike will be dealing with startup investment readiness and the self-assessment for entrepreneurs. So very succinctly, what is Link Caribbean? Link is essentially here to support investable and growth-oriented startups who are actively looking to raise private investment. So as, as this would suggest, this is not a program for any and everyone. If you're not looking to raise private investment, this is probably not the program for you. In terms of the broader objective of Link, it's really to accelerate early stage financing in the Caribbean by firstly identifying those growth oriented startups that are good candidates for private investment. Um, also facilitating introductions between angel investors and growth, those sort of growth oriented startups. And finally, providing tools and other educational resources to really help those growth oriented startups in the whole capital raising process. Now, having given this very top level look at what Link is, Jeremy Bowman will now provide you with some insight into what angel investing is all about, as well as the current state of affairs of angel investing in the region, in which the World Bank has played a very critical role. Um, so I'd now like to hand over to Jeremy. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Damien. A uh, quick, quick kind of, um, functional question. Are you going to move the slides forward or, or will I be granted control? I will move them forward. Okay, okay. Well, again, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for uh, hopping on the, the webinar this afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be involved. Um, as Damien noted, I, I work at the World Bank Group um, in, on projects to develop angel investing throughout the world, primarily in this, uh, in this role within the Caribbean. I've been working for two and a half years um, on this initiative uh, to support uh, the, the angel ecosystem development. Uh, my other day job is I run an angel investing group in Washington, D.C. 
we're fairly large with about 50 members and we invest mostly in uh, early stage technology companies. However, uh, we are restricted to investing in our local neighborhood, so, so we do not invest internationally. So um, we can put that question aside. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to do just a couple of things, and this is going to be a very brief introduction because we have a lot of content to, to cover today. And, and there are certainly more resources that you can find about angel investing both at the Link Caribbean website and uh, also online. Uh, but I want to just cover today very quickly, um, give you an introduction to angel investing and kind of suggest why it could be uh, potentially relevant for you. Um, I'll do that by just talking about um, who angel investors are, um, give some thoughts about how they behave and invest, and then uh, give an overview of what an angel investment like, might look like um, with a look towards uh, what's been happening in the region. So simply the definition of an angel investor is, is an individual who invests their own money and, and quite importantly their time directly into companies in which they have no family connection. They're looking for a financial gain. Um, so this is very different from a family member or an uncle who, who provides you with a little bit of seed money uh, to get your business started. These are strangers who are oftentimes business persons who are looking to partner uh, in your business. And I want to say that, you know, can you, you just, in the Caribbean, um, as in most places in the world, even before out of the World Bank and other partners came onto the scene, angel investing happens, right? It's an activity that's going on everywhere, but um, a lot of it happens informally. So it's between people who are within close social and professional circles, so it's hard to get access to investors, and that's one area where we're trying to improve uh, the conditions for entrepreneurs. Um, it's often done rather informally, uh, which means perhaps a handshake investment, um, and there's no structure or, or governance around the investment. So again, we're working to, to help formalize the structure of investing uh, in angel-type deals, uh, which gives protection to both investors and certainly to entrepreneurs. Um, and then back to the first point is that we want to improve accessibility. Um, so that's been our kind of focus on why we like organized angel investing as a, as a financing solution for, for entrepreneurs. Okay. All right, so I think everybody on the call today probably appreciates that in the Caribbean it is very difficult for startups to get uh, to get funding and to get financing. Um, and this is for a, a number of reasons. Um, and, and also because of that, that's why we like angel investing is because it's, it's almost counter, or it's the, the opposite um, opportunity with regards to other uh, funding solutions. So, so first off, uh, angel investors can be very flexible. They are investing their own money, uh, so they can set the terms, they can negotiate terms with entrepreneurs. Uh, so that means they can use debt, they could use equity, uh, you can come up with other creative structures like revenue sharing. Uh, basically, most things are on the table, uh, even if most angel investors en end up investing in, in equity. Um, angel investors will consider startup and early stage companies. So this could be even be pre-revenue or companies that are just at the final stages of product or technology development. I think this is really important when you think about um, what a bank likes to see when they um, look at um, candidates for a loan. They want to see collateral. They want to see a history of, uh, of responsible borrowing. Um, and angel investors, yes, they want to see uh, discipline in how you've managed money in the past, but uh, they don't have the same uh, requirements and uh, kind of strictness that a, that a bank may have. Um, critically, angel investors bring a lot of non-capital value. So this means when you receive angel investment, uh, you're actually not just receiving money, you're receiving a business partner. So this is a person that's probably worked for many years in, uh, in a professional field, has a lot of expertise, they've managed people, they have a lot of um, business networks and experience that can be really valuable um, to growing your company um, and to providing strategic guidance. So the non-capital value can be, can be incredibly important. Um, and then finally, uh, just like they'll consider funding startup companies, 
uh, angel investors tend to have more curiosity and interest in um, non-traditional businesses or, or new business opportunities. So if you have, a, for instance, a, a technology company, um, a bank may not know how to um, evaluate your business model, but an angel investor is probably going to be a little bit more open-minded and flexible when they're uh, considering your, your business. I'll go through this quickly. Um, this is just to give a, a sense of the types of individuals and characteristics of, of angel investors as, as persons. Um, first, while some are incredibly and fabulously wealthy, uh, many are not. Many are just successful business persons. They have day jobs, and, but they do have some free cash that they're willing uh, to invest. Generally, they've arrived at a point in their life where they are looking for financial return, but they're also looking for um, you know, extracurricular projects. So not a hobby, much more serious than a hobby, but, but certainly a way where they can lend value to a company um, in non-capital ways and, and kind of take it on as a project. So um, there's, there's kind of that opportunity to connect with an investor. Um, when we say they have free cash but do not have to invest, and um, that's very true. There, there's no obligation. You can be an angel investor and you can rarely, if ever or never, write a check. Um, so there's no obligation when, when you meet with investors. Um, while a lot of um, angel investors, at least in the U.S. and in Europe, may have software and, and technology backgrounds, generally they're not the scientists nor the technologists. And the primary reason I, I mentioned this in this presentation is just to, to kind of emphasize that for, um, for companies that are going to investors, and Mike will talk about this in more detail, um, you can't just wow them with a product or a new widget. They, they want to see a business. Uh, they want to see a, a financial model around what you're doing. Um, finally, as I've already mentioned, uh, most have experience as leading uh, businesses. They also get involved because they want some excitement. So they definitely want to uh, be partnering with you on a, on a journey. They're, they're aware that it's going to be some ups and downs, uh, but they want to have uh, some thrill in the ride. Uh, very quickly, um, because this gets asked frequently, is, is what would an angel investment look like? Um, and I'm going to just break it down into four key factors here. Um, the first is, you know, how much money can I expect from an angel investor? Um, when an individual is writing a check, it's generally anywhere from $5,000 up to $100,000 per person. Um, but often, and this is um, with organized angel investor groups, certainly what tends to happen is a number of individuals will pool funds together and they may make a group investment of anywhere from fifty dollars to um, let's say four hundred thousand um, dollars. When they are investing, they are looking for um, really high scalability opportunities. So they want to see the potential for at least a five times return of their money. Um, they would love to dream about ten times and more, but realistically, they're looking for for about five times their money um, within a time frame of anywhere from five to ten years. Um, and Mike will will talk a little bit more around about exits and, and how you have to look at your company through a strategic lens of, of how you return capital and, and make money for investors. But um, generally this happens through a bigger company uh, buying you for strategic value or for, for uh, potential to, to grow your business. Uh, finally, most will want equity, uh, but as I mentioned before, uh, a number of investors are, are certainly open-minded towards looking at uh, alternative investment structuring for, for angel investments. All right, and so to make this a little bit more real for everybody, because you kind of heard me talk and you know I invest in the U.S., um, I want you to be aware of what is happening in the Caribbean because it's, it's pretty exciting and I think it's a, it's a great example of what can happen when um, you know, partners come together on the entrepreneur side and on the investor side. Um, and so what we have right now is a, is a, is a community where there are five uh, investor groups meeting. There are two in Jamaica, two in Trinidad, one in Barbados. And it's important to point out that all of these groups 
are at different stages of development. So they have different meeting schedules. They have slightly different processes around how they screen and review companies and hold their meetings and conduct due diligence. Uh, but suffice it to say that there is now an opportunity to, uh, to get in front of investors if you fit their criteria, which, which Mike will uh, talk about in more detail. Um, at this point, over 40, and this is probably more like 50 companies, have presented to these investor groups. Um, and this isn't a formal presentation with members um, uh, in private meetings. So um, the many, many other companies have been reviewed. And I think um, you know, it's, it's fair to say that six investments have been made out of about, say, 50 companies pitching. And that's quite a good ratio. So, so six investments out of 40 companies or 50 companies presenting out of 400 or so that have perhaps applied. Um, it's not meant to discourage, it's actually meant to in encourage because uh, compared to other places in the world, um, it's not, those, those are not bad figures. Um, those investments have ranged from 50 to about 180,000. Uh, all have been equity aside from one small loan. And finally, um, these are some insights that we've been getting from our interactions with investors. So, so the, the points here um, reflect the interests and what seems to attract uh, investors to, to firms. Um, at the top, it's, it's they want to see a built product. So they're not quite as interested in a, in a very exciting idea. Um, in fact, there's little interest in funding ideas. Um, they want to see a company that is at least on the cusp of commercialization. Uh, traction with customers is um, <laughs> is always going to help you with investors, um, not only because it gives you uh, proof points in the marketplace, but also because it gives them a, a reference point. So they can actually talk to the customer and, and really get a lot of insight into to why your product or service is of value. Um, they want to see scalability. Mike will talk about what this means. Um, it kind of happens at three levels. One is at the, the country or island uh, level. The second would be regional. And then the third would be international and, and new markets. Uh, they want to be able to add value. And finally, they're looking at uh, solutions to business challenges. But before Damien jumps ahead, I'll just say that these companies at the bottom, all those logos are companies that have received uh, angel investment. And then finally, RAIN, the Regional Angel Investor Network, this is a, a component of the Link Caribbean project. And our, um, our expectation or our, our hope with RAIN is to create a regional investors community, um, which both helps us develop relationships with investors uh, and also facilitates introductions with entrepreneurs. So what this means for you is that um, it makes investors more accessible. So there's a platform. and, and Dane will talk you through how you access it, but you, you're able to apply to a network of investors that includes the five groups that I mentioned, but also a couple of international groups from Canada and uh, the U.S. currently, and this is a network we, we hope to grow. Um, what's important for you to understand is that from our side or from Caribbean Export side, um, these investors, before they join the, the, the community, they go through an application and a screening and an interview and a vetting process, much like um, entrepreneurs go through with investors because we want to make sure we have the right kind of people with um, motivations and interests that are aligned with um, what we've been seeing in the region from both investors and uh, entrepreneurs uh, to be involved in the, the community. So, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop. Um, certainly welcome any questions when we, when we come back to the Q&A. Uh, and thanks again for, uh, for joining us today. Damien, if you are speaking, I believe you're muted. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, that will help. Um, okay, so thanks again, Jeremy. Um, now that Jeremy has provided some context and background on the concept of angel investing and what is taking place at the regional level, I'd now like to take a deeper look at the services being offered through RAIN 
and how growth-oriented startups can apply. So when we look at the startup enabling environment, you'll see that a lot of the business support organizations, which includes incubators and accelerators, they provide services such as market access, product support, as well as some level of mentorship and coaching and other business development support. But what is often missing, however, is support on trying to raise capital. So at that critical stage when companies are looking to, to raise private investment, support in that area seems to be lacking. So Link really seeks to provide solutions to these problems being faced by these growth-oriented startups when trying to raise funds. And it does that through the provision of the following services. So the first, um, Jeremy would have spoken about it. It's really to the investors that we are friends with, that we have contacts with in the, um, the region. So the five angel groups that are currently on RAIN. And we also look to be broadening that and engaging um, angel investors in the diaspora as well in the future. So this is a community that we are going to try to support and build where we could introduce promising entrepreneurs to, to these investors that we vetted. Um, the second thing is investment facilitation, which will be done through two grants that we're going to be providing, and I will expound on that in a bit. And finally, there are also going to be tools and some educational resources, which includes access to mentors where possible, um, that we're going to provide under the, within the program as well. So in terms of the investment facilitation, I alluded to two grants um, that we have in place that are really geared to help these growth-oriented startups when they're trying to raise money. So the first one is the co-investment grant, or CI grant for short, and the investment readiness grant, or IR grant for short. So these are the two mechanisms that we have um, in terms of the investment facilitation. So I'm now going to go into a bit more detail um, for these two grants. So the co-investment grant or CI grant, they're really designed for companies that have already secured an investor and it allows for extra cash to go into the business without having to give up any more equity. So co-investment grants provide up to 50% match of the investment being made in, into the company by the private investor or investors up to a maximum of 100,000 US. So if you're looking at a best case scenario, an investor is investing $200,000 into a company. The company and the investor would apply jointly for the CI grant. And if successful, that grant will inject an additional 100,000 US into that company. But that company would only be giving up equity for the 200,000 um, US that the investor is investing. So essentially it's a win-win for both the investor and the company. It helps the risk the investment somewhat in that more money is actually being injected into the company and the company now has more runway to do the sorts of things it needs to do to make it help make it successful. And the company is um, gaining extra cash, cash and not having to give up any more equity. There are some eligibility requirements that people should be cognizant of. Um, I'm not gonna go into great detail. Um, a lot of this, is, this information is available on the Link Caribbean website. Um, which will be provided later and this presentation will also be provided to all, all registrants but just to know that you have to be a legally registered entity in CARICOM with the exception of Haiti for the CI grant you have to have actually pitched to an investor already so you have to have actually secured an investor and have what is called a term sheet you should have already signed a term sheet with the investor that really outlines the details of the, um, the deal, the investment. You must pass a personal and business fiduciary background check. So there is some level of due diligence that is gonna take place on both the investor and the founders of the company. And just to, for as an important note, um, the World Bank has some environmental and social guidelines that must be adhered to. So companies in like the tobacco or alcohol industry are not eligible. So anything that can be deemed environmentally or socially detrimental is um, not eligible for the CI grant. And you'll also see that it's not eligible for the, the investment readiness grant as well, but I'm jumping ahead. 
Um, so these are some of the eligibility requirements, but as I indicated, there are a lot more. And in terms of the eligible use of funds as well, there's a lot more information on these two areas on the website, which I um, urge everyone to, to visit. There are, I should mention, there are a few companies who have actually secured investors and applied for CI grants, but because they're still in the review process, we can't really divulge any information on these companies, only to say that um, we, we hope to be able to make announcements in this regard in the coming months. With regards to the investment readiness grants or the IR grants, these are designed to really assist those growth-oriented startups that show strong investment promise but may not yet consider, be considered investment ready by investors. So this grant can provide funding of 25,000 US to those companies along, very importantly, along with investment readiness support. So it's not a matter of just accessing a grant and you go on your merry way, but um, the, the, the program seeks to provide some guidance and support to these IR grant recipients along the, their journey of actually utilizing the $25,000 grant. So this grant, again, I should mention, it needs to be used over the course of six months. And the, the use of funds, again, there are some eligibility requirements. But at the end of the day, they really need to fund specific activities over the six month period that would improve their prospect for investment after the six months. So, so a true measure of success of the program would have IR grant recipients within a six month period or after a six month period actually apply with an investor for a co-investment grant. Because that way we, we could really see that okay, they, they, they put the money to good use over the six month period. They did the sorts of things that the investors indicated they needed to do. And they're now at the point where they're actually um, getting private investment into their company and applying for the, for the CI grant. So this, this um, use of funds is extremely important. And again, the eligibility requirements um, are all online. So you can take a look there. One thing I should note is that um, you'll see the last note there under the eligibility. You must be actively seeking angel or other private investment. So if you're merely a company that's looking for a loan or a grant, again, this is not the program for you because at the end of the day, this program is geared towards accelerating early stage financing in the region. So it's really about companies that are looking to raise, raise private capital. In terms of, I just want to give you a quick snapshot of some of the recipients of the Investment Readiness Grant. Um, these would span over the course between October and February. There are six companies that represent three countries. We have Jamaica, Barbados, and Trinidad. I'm not really going to, you see the names there. But just to, to say that um, they range in terms of the industries. We had marketing companies. We had companies doing mobile and web applications. Um, we also had a manufacturer in there. Um, so it ranged, the industries ranged. And in terms of the use of funds, uh, most of the companies wanted to use some of the funds for sales and marketing to really acquire more customers. But again, the use of funds ranged from companies that were trying to um, further validate their, their product by doing a pilot product launch, a paid pilot product launch um, with a financial institution. Um, one of them was purchasing a piece of equipment to increase their production capacity. And there was another one that was further um, building out their tech platform to, to really um, get that MVP up and running. So um, th this just gives you an idea, a snapshot of some of the companies that have been able to access the, the investment readiness grant. And again, I, I should note here that these companies are also um, being provided support and advisory support and mentorship um, while they're going through the, the process of actually um, trying to put those funds to, um, to good use over the six month period. In terms of applying to LINK, again, I don't want to go into great detail. Um, Mike is going to give you some very important information as to how you can really do a self assess perform a self-assessment on your company to determine whether or not you're a good fit for private investment and by extension link. 
So I would, I would urge everyone to pay attention to that presentation. But apart from that presentation, um, we, we, we plan to do a future webinar dedicated solely to the, the self-assessment because it, it's going to take quite a bit of time to get through everything. So Mike's going to do an abbreviated presentation on that. Um, but again, I'd urge everyone to sign up for the, the full webinar on, on doing a self-assessment. Um, so once you've been able to do the self-assessment and you think you're the right fit, you could go to this website here, which is the RAIN um, platform. It's a procedure platform where you can fill out the application completely online. And there are some additional documents that you're going to need to upload, um, one of which is the pitch deck, which would be the type of pitch or presentation you would give to investors when seeking to raise private investment, um, along with um, certain requirements like your business registration forms, financial statements and projections, as well as the resumes of your, your management team. There are some other requirements as well. And again, more information is available on the Link Caribbean website. So I'm really not going to get into much details here. Now, when companies apply, apply to Link, during the process, there's going to be a screening that's going to take place of all ap applications that come in. At the point when they are screened by the internal screen team, we may determine that some of those companies qualify for the investment readiness grant. If that is the case, then there'll be additional follow-up where these companies or applicants will be asked to answer a few more questions. And more importantly, or most importantly, they'll be asked to provide a detailed budget and work plan for the use of funds over the six month period. So again, I cannot um, overestimate the, how critical this use of funds is because this use of funds really, it needs to be in sync with the feedback that the company has gotten from the investors and the recommendations as to how these funds should best be used to put that company in a more attractive investment position at the end of six months. Um, so once the applicants have completed these additional questions, have submitted their, their use of funds and, and refined their pitch deck, they will receive some pitch preparation assistance from the, the link team. And once that is done, they will be put in front of an investment readiness committee and asked to pitch to that committee. And it is this committee that ultimately makes the decision as to whether or not those applicants or candidates will receive the investment readiness support. Um, even though you may be turned down at this, at this stage, that doesn't mean that you're eliminated from, from LINK altogether. If you've gotten that far, most likely you will be put onto some sort of education stream or education path where you'll be you'll you'll get a link to a lot of resources um, that could help you plan um, along your journey of entrepreneurship and it may also provide access to to mentors both internally and externally so so again don't be discouraged if you've gotten to the point of the pitch and um, you do not receive the actual investment um, at the end or, or IR grant at the end of it, I should say. So with that, this really completes the link overview. And I'd now like to introduce Mike Lightman, whose presentation will be focusing on startup investment readiness with some insight on what investors are looking for and really helping you determine whether or not you're the right fit for raising private investment and by extension link. So I'll hand over to you, Mike. Uh, thank you very much, Damien. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so at this point, the question that might be in the back of everybody's mind is, how do I know which program I am qualified for, right? If we boil it down, there are fundamentally two different tracks that a company can go down. One of them is I am ready for an investor and I can get up to $100,000 no, no anything uh, in addition, no equity, just grant if I raise. The other one is I'm kind of on the precipice of raising money. There's something missing, maybe that chicken and egg where the investor says, I need to see something. And you say, I can't build it until I have some cash. And then we have that $25,000 program plus some additional support. So really what we're wondering is, how do I know which one I qualify for? 
and how can I kind of go into the mind of an investor and know what they're looking for before I go in front of them. So just keep in the back of your mind that this is an abbreviated version of a self-assessment that we've put together. We will have a separate, more in-depth version that will allow for more Q&A and engagement and some takeaway material where you can read additional articles and you can read more on definitions and everything else. I will say as I'm talking, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in and at the very end we can go through and answer them as we need to. So to kick it off, um, the first thing that we might want to think about is what does an investor look for? So this is really the strategic end, right? And when we're thinking, should I be going for equity investment, debt investment, or something else, we can boil this down to four simple things. The first one is market. And I break this into two specific pieces. The first one is, is my product or service nice to have or need to have? And think about this really in a policy or an economic driving way. So for instance, if wherever you are uh, turns around tomorrow and says every single person has to drive an electric vehicle by law, it becomes need to have. Now obviously this is a bit of an exaggerated example, but I suppose you understand what I'm saying from that. So you know some items are a luxury. So for instance, if we're looking at premium foods, oftentimes no matter how good it is and how much of an improvement it is, that might qualify as a nice to have as opposed to a need to have. The other big part that comes along with market is if I sell this to every possible person I can sell it to, how much money will I make? Right? And that's, <clears throat> that's what we call a bottom up market assessment. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a bit. The next one of these quadrants is the competitive advantage. And I look at this once again in two separate ways. The first one is today. Who are the existing competitors? And even if there isn't a direct competitor, what is the indirect competitor? And that could be what is the solution that people are using today? <clears throat> even if it's ungainly and difficult and expensive, what is there really? And then more importantly, well, I guess to that extent, how easy will it be for me to get that market share from the competition? But then really more importantly is one or two years down the road, we're successful, everything is going really well, Let's just say that I hand a bag of cash to your competitor. How are we going to prevent them from stealing all of your market share? How will you prevent that from happening? Do you have intellectual property? Do you have some unique channels? Basically, how can you make sure that nobody is going to, to steal what you've done in the future? Arguably, the most important piece of this whole thing is the third one, which is team. And I like to say that really what they're looking for is this unique combination of cult leader, inventor, salesperson that are co completely committed to the project, ideally at least two co-founders, people that have taken ownership of, of whatever it is that you're doing, that are somehow humble, actively seeking feedback, but confident enough, and ultimately they vibe with the investors. They, they have a good relationship, and really at the end of the day, to really boil it down even more, we would say it's somebody that when the investor makes the investment, they can trust that you're going to do the right things without having to, air quotes, babysit. I don't mean this condescendingly, I just mean that the investor, because they're going to have their money involved, will want to make sure that your visions are aligned. Finally, um, this is probably the obvious one, is the investor return on investment. As Jeremy mentioned before, um, you know, the investors are looking for anywhere from a 3 to 10x return on their money. The reason for this, the very simplified reason for this is, I would say, 7 of every 10 investments fail. So what's happening is the investor isn't just trying to get the return from you, they're trying to get the return from all of the losses they've gotten from everyone else. So you have to compensate for everybody else's losses in a 5 to 10 year path. So it doesn't need to be specifically, I can get you X return, but there has to be some mechanism in place and some vision for you to be able to get them back some range of money that can compensate not just for you, but for the other companies that may fail. So we've looked at this strategically. The next way that we might want to look at this is from a timeline perspective. Assuming that you have this, really we're looking at this now on how far along in the process are you. So theory, and really, I am not telling you anything definitive. I want you to think this is a hypothetical way that an investor might look at your company and how they might categorize you. So in that first bucket, we see possible co-investment. Really what I'm saying is this is the kind of company that an investor would probably be very excited to invest in 
today. And fundamentally, I'm sure you can read the bullet points, what we're saying is the company is up and running, they are in revenue, they, are, they have the potential to scale rapidly, they are just missing something to help get them to that next step. But ultimately, everything is proven, everything is moving forward, and they're going to that next step. Theoretically, the possible investment readiness grant goes back to that chicken or egg scenario, which is fundamentally when you say, look, I've got something right at the precipice of being successful, but what I need is a cash infusion to make sure that I can lock in that next customer or build that product to where it needs to be or something else. And this is oftentimes when the investor says, yeah, like I believe you, but I'm not giving you any money until I see it happen. And you can go back and forth on this and ideally, this is where we think that investment readiness grant can really add a lot of value. And then finally, there's that case by case scenario and we can't tell you what's going to happen, but fundamentally this is that I have my idea on a piece of paper or you're somewhere between idea on a piece of paper and really ready to launch the product. Sometimes investors will like it, sometimes they won't, but there's no real way of gauging that. So what we've done is put together an assessment checklist of how you can go behind the paywall and think like an investor, go behind the wall and think like an investor when you're assessing your own company. And we've broken it down into three different categories. The first one in yellow are basically the actual fundraising questions to basically make sure, am I a right fit? Am I doing the right things? Is my company in the right place uh, logistically? And then finally, do I have the right mindset to really want to raise money? The next one, which is that green, is the timeline. Operationally, how far am I? And then the last one, which is in blue, is the strategic end and making sure, is my company really the right fit? <clears throat> Today, we only want to talk on five of these, and we're going to do so very quickly. These are the equity, control, sales, product, and market size. So I'm just going to dive right in. The first one we're going to talk about is equity. As Jeremy had talked about earlier, when an investor makes an investment in you from an equity investment as opposed to a debt investment. In a debt investment, they're saying, here is money, what I want is that money back after a certain amount of time with some interest. With equity, they're saying, I want some ownership of your company. So literally, as the value of your company grows, the value of my investment grows. This can be very, very expensive, and oftentimes, if you can get a bank loan, it is a much cheaper way to go about it. However, with highly scalable um, growth-oriented companies, that is oftentimes not an option. So really, when this is happening, the thing to keep in the back of your mind is it's all about negotiation. So you might be getting X dollars of cash and giving away anywhere from five to 40% of your company. And there's a lot more that goes along with that too. It's not just the percentage, but other uh, items that go into the term sheet. So really, this is a very simple question. Are you interested in giving away equity? Are you okay with giving away some ownership of your company and structuring your company differently? If the answer is yes, and look, I get it, terms are negotiable, fantastic. If you're not quite sure and you're looking at that loan structure, you might not be ready for this kind of investment. So jumping into the next one, which is a little bit, um, I guess kind of along the same line is control of your company. And as we talked about earlier, when an investor makes that investment in you, they're, they're putting their own money in, right? And they wanna make sure that your vision and their vision is aligned. And it's not good enough for them to just say, I trust you. Oftentimes you will be forced legally to create a board of directors. And this is different from a board of advisors, but fundamentally the role of this board of directors is to make all major decisions. So before, whenever you want to hire somebody or change your product, you just do it. But now, once you have an investor, what will happen is you might have anywhere from three to seven people on this board, depending on your stage, one of which will be you or your co-founder, one of which will be somebody neutral, and one of which will be the investor. And from that point forward, it will be negotiated beforehand the types of decisions that have to be voted on, but it could be anything from how do we develop the product, what market do we go into, how do we use these funds, or anything else, from that point forward, you have to run it in front of your board, and then they can make that decision. Now, you know, there's this probably sounds very negative, but there's an upside in that most investors come with a depth and a breadth of experience along with contacts, so they should be adding a lot of value. So fundamentally, if you're in kind of the mindset right now where you're looking for somebody else who can help guide you to that next step, this is perfect. 
However, if you still have a very specific vision of how you want the company to go and you want to drive that forward and relinquish control a little bit later, you might want to reconsider the route to which you're looking for cash. Um, so going on to the next piece, which is my favorite, we're talking about do I have any paying customers? <clears throat> and really this one is, is a really tough nut to crack because there are all kinds of ways to sell. But some of the most successful companies that I have ever seen have actually sold their product or service before their product has been built. And that's because they understand the pain in the market so badly that they're able to do that. Now we might be asking, why is this important? And I would, I would think about everything that you're doing in the following manner. It is the investor normally will get very excited about what you're doing. Hopefully will get very excited about what you're doing because what you're doing is probably very exciting. And logically it makes a lot of sense. But it is the re investor's responsibility to not believe anything that you say, and it is your responsibility to prove it to them. Not because they're mean, evil people, but because it's their money, and it's their fundamental responsibility to them, their family, and whoever else gave them that money. So the best way to prove that there's a real market out there, and you want to prove the market because revenue is how you make money, is you line up paying customers. So look, the best way to do it, you line up a customer whether or not your product is built. It might be somebody willing to pay or paying for something that comes out in a month. At the same time, I understand how insanely difficult that can be. If you have a letter of intent or a letter of interest, oftentimes that's just as good. And even then, if your business model is insanely complex, you're a two-sided market that's reliant on advertisers and you hit X number of people using your platform on a daily basis, I get that too and as will the investors. So if you can prove that there are advertisers that are willing to pay you money, once you hit a certain threshold, and you can prove that you can get that threshold, that's also okay. There's a little bit of reluctancy by investors though, if you haven't spoken to the customers, if you don't have any commitment from them, kind of that, or I will build it, they will come, and trust me, it's very complex, but it will happen. And like I said, it's not that people don't believe the logic of what you're saying and that they think that it's a bad idea. It's simply that it's their money and it's their responsibility to not believe you until you prove it. So moving on to the next one kind of along that same line is how developed is my product? Um, what we oftentimes think about is the minimum viable product. And that, you know, my kind of cruder terminology, it is the worst simplest, stupidest version of something that you can build that your customer would still be willing to use and or pay for. So ideally, by the time you have an investor, your MVP is already operational. Maybe it's even more advanced than that, and that's even better. Um, once again, kind of it's still okay if you're building the minimum viable product. It's not there, excuse me, but it's still along the, the way. Sometimes investors might have a problem though if it's still on the idea on a piece of paper. Obviously, if you're a software company, this is different than if you're a hardware company and everything is case by case, but we're just trying to give you a little bit of a mindset of how the investor might approach it depending on where you are. So the last one of these five that we'll talk about today is how big is my market? And really this boils down to if I sell this to every possible customer I can sell this to, how much money do I make? And generally, you know, there's what's called a top-down market assessment, which is when you say my total addressable market is based off of an industry, which is X billion or Y trillion dollars per year. If I get, you know, some percentage of that, that should be realistic. While that's interesting and it's very good to identify whether the market is growing or shrinking, oftentimes what investors are interested in is what's called a bottom-up assessment. And that's essentially when you say, this is my market demographic, this is how they oftentimes respond to the same types of marketing or promotion or sales material. This is the size of the market. Um, and basically, this is how much I can sell my product to based off my business model. If I were to sell this to every demographic, every person I could sell it to, you know, not necessarily today, but in the future, this is how much money. The best case scenario is this is a global market. Literally everyone can buy this. We're looking at millions, billions of customers and or dollars. Look, once again, that's, that's kind of that unicorn idea. It's still great if you can sell your product or solution across the Caribbean and a few other places, and you can have reoccurring revenue that is a very high amount. The only time that an investor might become a little bit more reluctant is if you're saying our solution only addresses a 
problem that's in a few areas across the Caribbean or other small areas, and we'll be a very sustainable company. We'll be very uh, successful, but we will not have that potential exponential sales growth and revenue growth that's necessary to provide a 3 to 10x return in the next couple of years. So today, going back to what we talked about these five things, um, ultimately what we're looking for is somebody that can give away equity, that's willing to give away equity. Um, actually, Damien, you mind skipping to the next slide? Somebody that's willing to give away equity, give away control, is in revenue, product built with a huge market. Um, this is a broad stroke. None of this is specific, and you know we're happy to answer questions today, and we will be going into more detail in the next couple of weeks um, about all 11 of these, along with some handout material that you can read on your own, some additional ideas and feedback and articles on this. So thank you very much, and now I will pass it back to Damien. All right. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Um, so having said all of, all of that today, we gave you a overview of Blink, we gave you an overview of Angel Investing, and Mike did a very good job of taking you through some sort of self-assessment that companies should do before actually looking to, to apply to Link or to raise private capital. So you've done all of that. You've done the private day self-assessment. You think you're ready. What do you do, do next? So I would advise that if you're in Jamaica, your first point of contact should be the country advisor there. That's Harold Davis, who's on the line, and he's free to answer any questions that you may have. Um, if you're not in Jamaica, but let's say you're in Trinidad, we do have Gerard Thomas, who's actually the project officer, but also acting as the country advisor for Trinidad. So he'd be your first point of contact there. And if you're anywhere else in the region, OECS or any other country not listed, um, you could contact myself um, or you could also contact Gerard if, if necessary. We also have the website that I alluded to earlier, um, link-caribbean.com where you could find out more information about all the link services as well as the eligibility requirements for the, the various grants. You can apply directly to Link through the RAIN Procedure platform. And if you've already secured an investor, you can apply directly for the co-investment grant. Um, again, on the Procedure platform, but it's a different link. Um, so caribbean-cigrant.procedure.com is where you would apply for the co-investment grant. Now, if you're interested in attending any future webinars and wish to receive this presentation, you can also join our mailing list by going to this link here. We already do, however, have your email addresses if you registered for this, this um, webinar. So what I will do later today or first thing in the morning is actually send out this presentation that you could then look through at your, your leisure. Um, we are also recording this webinar, and once we convert it, we will upload it to YouTube, and we will provide that link for you as well. So you could either send to colleagues that couldn't join, or you could also do a refresher and, and get all this information again. Um, very importantly, as Mike mentioned, we do intend to do future follow-up webinars, the first one of which will be the uh, more detailed self-assessment. Um, review, and we'll also provide some additional um, material on that as well. So I'd urge you to, when we do have the sign up for that webinar, that you guys sign up so you can get more information in that regard. So having said all of that, we have about 20 minutes left, so very good timing on our part. Um, opening up the floor to questions, so feel free again to either type in your questions or to Raise your hand and I'll unmute you so you could ask your question. Okay, we have a question from Nadia Wright. Nadia, you're, you're, you're live now. Hello, Nadia? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I was actually uh, trying to indicate that I was unable to hear you from my side, but it has been enabled. Oh, okay. All right, sorry to hear that. Um, as I mentioned, you will get a recording of the 
the presentation once we are able to convert it to a MP4 on YouTube. Okay. Okay, so all right, any anyone else? Let me see here. Yes, Julian Greg, you have a question? Hi, afternoon. afternoon. I was just trying to just trying to get some clarity with regards to time frames. So you've spoken about the CIA and the AR. Um, what type of time frames are you talking about getting the applications in? Any deadlines? And when would when are you looking to make any decisions in regards to these? Okay, great. Very good question. Um, we are actually it's the, the both grants right now are actually rolling cycles. Um, so if you've already lined up a an investor, you can apply right now for the CI grant. As I mentioned, there are a couple currently under review. And the IR, again, you would apply to link through the RAIN, through the RAIN platform, and you would go through a screening process before you actually get um, referred. Or, or um, once we, we see that you qualify for the IR, then that's when you would go to the, um, the IR committee. But it's, a, it's, it's open, and it's going to be open. Um, throughout the course of the program. So there's no deadline date per se until the, the, the program ultimately comes to an end. Um, right now, the, the program is scheduled to run until November 2017. However, um, that there could be a possible extension, but again, just think that November 2017 for now. All right, thanks. Okay, um, I see there's a question here typed in um, from Randall Howard. He's asking, is there a ceiling for an investment for Trinidad? Um, by that, I'm not sure if he means if there's like a quota for how many um, grant recipients can be from Trinidad or the total investment um, amount from Trinidad. Um, there's no quota um, per country. Obviously, we want to see a good spread um, throughout the region, but um, there's no real ceiling that has been set for any one, one country. So if there are some CI grant um, candidates from Trinidad, um, we would look at those. Um, there's another question typed in by Jason James. Um, he's asking, is there anything in place for mature companies? Um, I know throughout the presentation we've been mentioning startups a lot and growth-oriented startups, but this does not exclude if there's an established company that is doing some real interesting things that investors might get excited about. Um, so they're more than welcome to apply um, for, to, for Link and, and to Link. So again, there's no nothing stopping mature companies from applying. I hope that answered your question, Jason. There's another question from Xavier Barnet. Um, are the French Caribbean projects concerned by the Link Caribbean Initiative? In terms of um, the French territories like Martinique and Guadeloupe and some of the other um, outermost and, and non-English speaking, they they actually they don't qualify or they're not eligible for any of the grants, um, as you would see from the eligibility requirements. However, they can apply through RAIN. So RAIN, as I said, is really a community to make those sorts of introductions. So if there are some very interesting and exciting projects coming from some of the French islands, once they're in the Caribbean region, um, we would screen those as well. And if we deem them to qualify or, or meet the standards and criteria for, for being, a, being in interesting to investors or having that sort of um, being a good candidate for investment, then we would try to see how we could facilitate and make those introductions. So I hope that answered your questions, Xavier. Um, Randall is clarifying, I think, with regards to the Trinidad, the question on Trinidad, the investment amount. Um, no, the as I mentioned before, the CI grant, if a the ceiling for the CI grant is 100,000 US. 
So if there's any investment um, being made into a company above 200,000 US, um, the maximum that that company will qualify for is still 100,000 US. Um, so if it's 400, again, it's still going to be 100,000 US that the company can qualify for, for, for the um, co-investment grant. There's a question from Pauline Joseph regarding the type of business and alcohol not supported. My business does not directly make alcohol, but our events or attendees consume it at our events. Um, I would say that this would qualify or, or you would be eligible for, for LINK. So it does not exclude you if you're a, a product or service that caters for events that serve alcohol and that of, of that nature. Um, it's only that you can't be in the manufacturing business, um, alcohol business or tobacco. So I hope that answered your question. Hold on one second. Questions are still coming in, fast and furious. Um, Michael Husbands has a question. Can persons apply for the IR grant and then also apply for the CI as well? So as I mentioned earlier, I, I think I alluded to the fact that the true measure of success of this program would be if an IR grant recipient were to later apply for a co-investment grant, because that would show that it really did its job in that that company needed a bit more help to get to invest already. And by um, putting the, the 25,000 to their specific activities, they were able to make themselves a lot inv more investable and actually receive investment where they're now coming to apply for a CI grant. So yes, it, you can actually receive an IR grant and apply for a CI grant. What I would caution you um, not to do is you already have an investor and you apply for IR grant as well as a CI. So you, at that point, I, I think you really need to make the determination as to which one you're better off applying for. So if you've already lined up an investor who's, um, you've signed a term sheet and he's looking, he or she is looking to invest in your company, I would say apply for the co-investment grant right away than rather going through the IR process. The, there's a question from Kristen Sweat. Hope I pronounced that correctly. You, she's saying that you mentioned as part of the requirements for the IR grant that the applicant must be actively seeking investors. What is the minimum number that should be targeted to be deemed as actively seeking? I wouldn't say there's there's any sort of minimum quantity that we're looking looking for, but we just need to see some sort of um, evidence that you have been approaching investors. So even if you could name um, a couple investors that you have seen and, and I think more importantly provide some of the feedback that you've received from the investors, I think that that will help go a long way in terms of um, putting forward a stronger case to the screening team because that way we could even do some due diligence and follow up and find out you know, what were the concerns from the investors because at the end of the day, we really want to be sure that you are actively seeking investment and you're not really just looking for, for a grant or a loan, um, which in many cases we know happens in the region. So again, I would just um, say, you know, just be able to provide details around that and any feedback that you would have received from those investors that you've approached. Um, one last question here. After the application is submitted, where do applicants pitch to investors and is there a specified format for pitching? Okay, so the second part of the question first, um, in this presentation, there's actually a link um, where it says pitch template. It, it's a link to that, that actual template that we're asking people to follow and to use as a guide um, for pitching. So it really is it's, it's a template that took some time to, to build and it's really what the investors, um, not only here in the region, but investors on a whole like to see um, for, from prospective investees. Um, so I would say use it as a guide. It's not, you don't have to follow it word for word. Um, but again, it, it's a very good uh, reference guide to use. So after the application is submitted, 
I think I mentioned, but it, it's going to go through an internal screening process. So we have an internal link team that, that helps screen the applications coming in. And based on the screening, um, companies, applicants will either get a letter indicating, you know what, you're not quite ready. These may be the reasons why. Um, so they'll receive some tailored feedback on why they may not fit the link program. Um, but those that actually do qualify for any of the, the various um, grants, for instance, they would receive a letter indicating that, yes, you have qualified for if it's the investment readiness, you have qualified for an investment readiness grant. And this is, remember I said, if you qualify for the IR, then you'll be asked to answer some additional questions along with um, providing a detailed budget and work plan for the use of the $25,000 grant funds. And then you will be asked to add that to the pitch and refine your pitch deck. And again, the team would help you along this process before you actually have to do a virtual pitch to, to the Investment Readiness Committee. So it would be a virtual pitch, not an actual face-to-face. -face. Um, it would be a virtual pitch. And again, you would get some, some assistance from the link team um, to do that. Um, there's a question here from Marjorie Beza. She asks, how can service-related businesses compete if such low emphasis is placed on us? I'm not sure where um, we actually indicated that service, service um, companies in the services industry do not qualify or, or are not part of this project. I think we mentioned it's any, it can be a product or service. So if we mentioned product, um, that didn't exclude services. So again, it, it doesn't matter if you're in the product or service industry. So you are more than welcome to apply and you, you would qualify just as well as um, someone that's doing products once um, there is um, some interest there that, that you can get from investors. Michael Husbands also asked a question, um, would a memorandum of intent suffice as proof of traction or do you need a signed contract? I think um, Mike alluded to this in his presentation where um, a letter of intent from a prospective customer um, would suffice. Um, it would be a good to have. So this would help, this would, would I guess, put you in a stronger um, position and, and would strengthen your case. So yes, that, that would help. It doesn't have to be a signed contract. Of course, a signed contract would, would even make it stronger. But if you, you're not at the stage um, that you have that, um, a memorandum of intent would suffice. Um, OK, um, that's all the questions that were typed out. Let me see if anyone else has their hand raised. Um, no more hands raised and I'm not seeing okay there is an, another question Jess just came in it was mentioned that the manager's resume is needed for the application is the competency of the applicants measured by their business background academically or otherwise um, maybe, maybe Jeremy can take this one so I'm just going to ask Jeremy if he's still on. Sure. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. I would say, look, when, when you send an application to an investor, when you send your materials, they do want to know what is your background. So one way is, of course, your resume, which will include previous places of work, um, education and credentials. And, and I know that's kind of important in the Caribbean. But the truth is that, yes, it can kind of get people impressed, but quickly when investors are looking at a, a company and, and even more specifically at an entrepreneur, they're looking at the intangibles. They're looking at what kind of characteristics does the person have, how hard have they worked, and there are various ways to kind of assess um, how much um, initiative the entrepreneur has put into the business. So a lot of times investors, for instance, will ask, how much of your, of your own money have you put into this? This isn't to see how rich you are. This is to say, are they serious and have they committed to this? Um, some investors will ask you know, things like, when have you ever managed a, a 
a project. So for instance, if you were at a university, they might say, that's nice you have a degree, but what kind of clubs were you in and, and did you um, organize any, any events or were you part of uh, the management team of any clubs? Uh, so there are different ways you can kind of show attributes that um, investors uh, want to see. So um, certainly, you know, everywhere in the world, people include their, their academic credentials, but um, how you can speak to and relate to an investor goes way beyond um, what your CV may say and, and why it's important to, to kind of present and, and pitch to investors because you can um, showcase some of your your personal skills because at the end of the day what they want to see is that the motivations, the interests, and the um, objectives and goals uh, between the entrepreneur and the investor are aligned. So, so I know that was a little uh, long-winded, but it is to say that um, don't let kind of a degree uh, hold you back or conversely think that, you've, um, that you're going to get an investment. All right. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Any other questions? Don't see any hands up. No more type. Oh, there is a question um, by Joshua Roach. Joshua, I'm going to unmute you. You hold on one second. For some reason, I'm not able to unmute you, Joshua. So I would ask you to type in your question if you can. Very strange. I'm not seeing any. He hasn't typed it in. Um, any other questions while we're waiting on Joshua? Okay, we have, again, okay, we have Elliot Jones. Um, you're now unmuted, Elliot? No, I didn't have a question. I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Kevon, do you have another question? Or was that was your hand raised previously? No, it was previously. Sorry. No problem. Okay, so um, Joshua has typed in his question. He asks, how much sales do you need to have to qualify for the IR? Again, I can either open the floor to Mike or, or Jer well, yeah, Mike or Jeremy to answer that, whoever wants to take it first. Uh, hi, hi. This is Jeremy. Um, well, the answer is really zero. Um, I mean, the the chances of of securing interest from investors is much higher if you have sales. Um, but as far as a, a qualifying criterion, um, sales is not um, you know not explicitly required. Um, I will say that when you look at sales and what is relevant, uh, there are various um, ways that you earn a sale, right? It could be a one-off sale or it could be a recurring sales model. So um, obviously investors love recurring sales. If you can show them that customer A bought a month ago and they're likely to buy again next month, if they buy every month, um, that's going to be attractive uh, to an investor. Um, as far as amounts, um, <laughs> Every investor is going to want to see as large a, of a contract as, as possible, but of course it depends on what your product or service is. Um, so what um, Mike probably talked a little bit about was um, also think about the margins, right? So if, if you can show investors that you are making a really high um, profit margin on your product, they're going to be much more interested. Um, so just a couple of things to consider when you, when you think about um, Kind of valuing sales as a um, as an indicator of of um, of uh, opportunity for for an investor. Mike, just to build off of that. Oh, go ahead, Damien. No, I'm saying, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, so just to build off, I agree with everything that Jeremy said, and just to build on it, uh, when you're thinking about this, I wouldn't think about it in terms of what are the very specifics that I have to do to qualify for this, because it really boils down to the investor, right? Like this is 
we're facilitating something between two groups. So what we're trying to do is get you more of that insight into how a lot of investors think and what they look for. And really this will depend company to company and it's like a giant moving three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. So really it's all about are you a great investment, are you fundamentally you know, a possibility for a high return, low risk, with a high feasibility to get it done now. And do I just believe all of this is going to happen? So, you know, think about it in, in that end and think about it in the extent of if I went in front of somebody else who's investing their own money, would this be enough or would this not be enough? And what else can I do to get myself there? All right, great. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, we'll take one last question. Um, we're actually out of time, so I'll just take one last question. Um, how much equity, well, actually, this one came in before. Um, if entrepreneurs are not in the business full-time, but only part-time, how is this viewed? Again, uh, Mike or Jeremy, you could jump in here. I can start this one off, and Jeremy can come in after. Um, Unless, Jeremy, you want to jump in now? I mean, the answer is easy. If it's, it's, it's generally not viewed favorably because they're giving you their money to be successful with. And if it's your second project or third project um, and you're not fully committed to it, if you're potentially distracted by something else, um, I would say it's, um, yeah, it's less than ideal. Yep, just to echo, that was probably a nicer way than I would have said it. I think that oftentimes if you are not fully committed, they won't even want to talk to you. All right, so one, I'm just going to get to one last one. And again, this is from Michael Jeremy. How much equity on average um, do investors look for from a startup? That's a good question. Um, the the basic answer is, is it depends, right? It depends on how much money you are asking for, and it depends on the, the stage of your business, um, if you have other investors in. Um, what is common is that the seed or angel raise. And so think if you're raising anywhere between, I would say it's fair to say in the Caribbean, 100000 to $250,000, um, the investor is probably going to say, you know, anywhere from, probably 20 to 30 percent of the company. It may go up or down. I think uh, when you think about that figure, um, you've got to weigh very, very heavily on the other side of the scale is the investor's time, right? You're looking for a partner or are you just looking for money, right? If they're just looking to give you money, then you may value that differently. Um, they may say, look, I'm coming with money and my experience, my um, coaching and my network are going to be way more valuable than my money, then, then you've got to kind of do a personal assessment on um, how you feel about working with this person and what kind of value that they can add. And I think the big takeaway here, it's a good question because I think what the, the real answer is, when you engage with investors, um, you have to do your own due diligence on them as well. So a lot of this was focused on what do investors want to see, but um, you know the reality is what do you want to get from investors as well, and so you should have um, your own expectations and your own wish list um, going into the, the relationship because you're going into to just that, a relationship in a, in a partnership. All right, great. Thanks a lot. I think that's the last question. Um, I just want to thank everyone again for, for joining in and for, for staying signed in. And again, look out for this presentation um, via email and we will also send the recording once we've converted it. And we will send you information on the next webinar. Again, that one will be about the self-assessment. Um, so look out for that. And again, thanks very much for joining in on this Tuesday evening. So have, have a good rest of the evening, guys. Take care. All right. Thank you. Yep. Take it easy, everybody. Cheers.